Well, good afternoon, everyone. Our chief medical officer will be uh, on the phone again today, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Fitzgerald for her uh, opening remarks and update through the night. Thank you, Premier. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll begin today with an update on the number of cases in our province. <clears throat> Since the media briefing yesterday, we have 13 new positive cases. All of these cases are within the Eastern Health region. The public health contact tracing is ongoing. Everyone considered close contacts will be advised to quarantine. The total number of cases in our province is now 148. By region, we have 139 cases in Eastern Health three in Central Health, one in Western Health, and five in Labrador Grenfell Health. Of our 148 cases, 111 are related to the Calls Funeral Home Cluster. 55% of cases are female and 45% are male. By age, we have 13 people under the age of 20, 22 between 20 and 39, 23 between 40 and 49, 32 between 50 and 59, 29 between 60 and 69, and 29 who are 70 or above. Nine people have been admitted to hospital due to the virus. Of these patients, two are in intensive care. Seven people have now recovered. In total, we have tested 2,332 people, and of these individuals, 2,185 people are confirmed negative. Sadly, I must also report that a person who was confirmed positive for COVID-19 has passed away in hospital. The individual was 78 years of age and had underlying health conditions. They were admitted to hospital from their home. The individual was linked to the Calls Funeral Home Cluster. We offer our most heartfelt condolences to the family at this difficult time. We continue to actively we review our public health measures to support reducing the impact of COVID-19 in this province. The public health measures we have in place are based on the evidence of what has worked elsewhere to reduce the spread of the virus. We are learning from them about what works so that we can lessen the impact in our province. And today I am ordering the following measures. Until further notice, funeral services, visitation and wakes are prohibited. Burials and weddings will be limited to no more than five people, including the officiant. Retail stores that remain open for essentials are to stop the sale of lotto, scratch tickets, and break open tickets in store. All travelers must self-isolate and are to remain on their own property. For those living in a condominium or apartment, if you are, not, if you are self-isolating, you must stay in your own unit. You are not permitted in the common spaces of those buildings. You cannot go for a drive unless it is to receive medical attention. I know people may be anxious about what is happening in our province. and Please know that these feelings are a normal reaction to what we are going through and that you are not alone. I want to thank everyone for doing their part for complying with our public health measures. I know how difficult this is for everyone, but your actions will make a difference. The health and safety of our province is everyone's top priority. I want to remind everyone that when we say we must maintain social distancing, this means keeping a physical distance of six feet between you and anyone else. It means not mingling with other people. This public health measure is important to reduce the spread of viruses like COVID-19 that spread by droplets from sneezing and coughing. Physical distancing, however, does not mean social isolation. I am uplifted by the creativity of of those who are using virtual meetups to socialize. I have seen many examples through social media from book clubs and shed and kitchen parties to music, singing and recitations and even a virtual group physical activity. We must remember physical distancing even when we are outside. For example, when you're snowmobiling, you should only be with those who are in your family. You should not be playing street hockey or basketball with other families. This is to ensure that we all stay in our own household bubbles and we don't break anyone else's. Again, I remind everyone of the importance of washing your hands well and often with soap and water or using an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. I want to thank the businesses and employers in the province for all of their hard work in these trying times. For those that remain open for essential services, thank you for your continued service. Thank you for making it easier for people to maintain physical distancing in your establishments. 
We recognize essential workers have to work. We are trying to find the balance. We need to ensure we continue to have our essential services, like our groceries and health care services. But we all have a responsibility to reduce the spread of COVID-19. And while I know what I am asking is difficult, we need to follow these measures to flatten the curve. This is not about finding a loophole around these measures. This is about protecting us all. Stay home unless it is essential for you to go out. And when you do go out, you must remember to practice physical distancing. As a recap, for those who may have just joined us, we have 13 new cases since yesterday's media availability. The total number of cases in the province is 148. The breakdown by health regions is 139 cases in Eastern Health, three in Central Health, one in Western Health, and five in Labrador Grenfell Health. We have also had our first death due to COVID-19. You, you all have the responsibility, we all have the responsibility to flatten the curve. Do your part, it will save lives. Please stay home and do not travel unless it is absolutely needed. My sincerest thanks to those who are staying home and looking after each other. It will take some time to see the impact of these measures. I've just told you about the number of cases that we have in the province. What is less obvious is how many cases we have prevented because of our collective actions. We will see the benefits of our actions, and we must be patient. Our collective actions today will have a significant impact on how COVID-19 progresses in our province. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. This is a solemn day for our province. And I am saddened to say that as we head into week three of our public health state of emergency with this extremely sad news. As we see the first death of a resident of our province due to complications of COVID-19 virus, we now have a family in our province who is grieving and impacted at the greatest extent due to this virus. As I said yesterday, this is not where we want to be today. This is never where we want to be. Not today, not tomorrow, not into the future. So I want to take this moment to pass along my deepest condolences to the family of the gentleman, a man who undoubtedly will be greatly missed by his family and his friends. I spoke to his son earlier today, and he expressed to me that the healthcare workers went above and beyond to help his father. He also said that the seriousness of COVID-19, this virus, had hit his own and their family, and that they do not want to see the same result for your family. They are asking for privacy at this time and ask that we all respect their wishes. As we send this family our sympathy, let us remember the importance of to practice physical distancing. We also ask, as Dr. Fitzgerald said, for everyone to be patient, have an understanding and compassion with each other, especially with our essential workers. We are in a challenging, we are in a tough time a time that is filled with emotion. And with emotion comes a want to be able to console one another, maybe with a hug, or provide a shoulder to cry on. It's our human nature. But we are in different times, a time where our loving and our kind touch can do more damage than good. So we also ask that you keep this gentleman, his family, his friends in our thoughts and prayers today as we continue to fight this virus together. We often wonder about cures for diseases that has affected our society in many ways and for many years. We've seen researchers, we've seen physicians, healthcare workers, and others search for cures of diseases that we've seen in our past. But we know that COVID-19, we know that this virus can't travel without you. It can't move without you. So practice social distancing. 
That's our best option today. And last night, as Dr. Fitzgerald said, one more time we saw our community come together. Where thousands of people in St. John's and surrounding areas stood, they stood on their doorsteps and made noises. They put signs in their windows as a sign of respect for our essential workers. Today, especially today, we want to send out a big thank you to those essential healthcare workers who have tended to this gentleman in his time of need. We know that your work is stressful. We know that it is emotional. We know that losing a patient is devastating. So thank you for all that you're doing, and I know you will continue to do. Now more than ever, I ask you to please take, as a population, our public health guidelines seriously. Only travel within the province when it's essential. Don't just drive around to get out of your house. Stay inside. Stay home. We know that this is a busy week with provincial and federal income supports being delivered. If you go out for essentials, like groceries, limit your visits to once a week. Don't take the entire family with you. Do not take your children. Just take one person. Take one person for, per family. Now, we've seen great examples of families working together, compiling their list to cut down on the amount of people going out to the stores. And I ask businesses, you can adjust your hours of operation to reduce the number of people in, inside your stores, reduce the, den the density. This may, this may need just increasing hours as opposed to cutting them back. It will provide for the social distancing, the physical distancing that's required so people can go out and get those essential items. This is about working together to stay apart, to keep everyone safe from COVID-19. Now, talking about working together, let's all do our part to stay apart. And speaking of doing our part, that is evident with the work that is also being done to support our most vulnerable population. The Newfoundland and Labrador Housing Corporation, in partnership with the Health and Community Services, they are working collaboratively with a wide range of community partners in housing and the homeless in the sector. They're looking at identifying issues and solutions to mitigate service disruptions and preparing for an immediate response to support homeless individuals who may require self-isolation due to COVID-19. There is an immediate response in place which involves Newfoundland and Labrador Housing. It involves their 1-800 housing line. They are triaging and working on call with community support staff from Eastern Health. This is to set up a response to homeless population and shelter providers. Some people that need assistance to support social distancing and physical distancing and self-isolation within the shelter system. Now, in addition to that, the federal government is providing further funding under the Reaching Home Strategy. So we are all working together to support all areas of our community. This includes the Emergency Operations Center. So this is a, a center, 1-833-771-0696, for many general inquiries that you would have, have outside of our healthcare sector. It could be about lots of essential businesses, about student assistance, about childcare, routine rules and guidelines. And you can also email COVID-19info. That's at our government website. We know we're going through tumultuous times in our province, our country, and around the world. And as Dr. Fitzgerald said, there are times you may feel alone. But there's a global population, and we are here to support each other. Today is a day of heartbreak as we see our first death to COVID-19. The time is now. We must all work together to weather the storm. But it's only through physical distancing that we will beat this. Let's take a hold of this virus and not let it take a hold of us. This has never been more important than on a day like today. As I conclude my remarks today, once again I send my deepest sympathy to the family and the friends of the gentleman who has passed away. And please respect their wishes for their privacy. 
Put yourself in their shoes. This could easily be you in this situation tomorrow. Newfoundland and Labrador, let's keep them in our thoughts and our prayers today. Thank you. I now pass it over to Minister Hagee for a comment. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Premier. Today is uh, a sad milestone in the evolution of this pandemic in Newfoundland and Labrador. We really have to take it, though, as a wake-up call. COVID-19 is not the simple flu. COVID-19 is a deadly virus. People have recovered, yes, and we wish those who have the disease at the moment uh, all our best for their recovery. I'm worried, though, that when I look around outside, while a lot of people have obviously taken our orders and instructions and recommendations to heart, that there are still people out there who really have not grasped the gravity of this situation. This is not a game. You need to stop looking for loopholes, ways to get round the recommendations and the orders that our Chief Medical Officer of Health uh, has put in place. What you do today will have repercussions. They may not come for a few days, they may not come for a couple of weeks, and they may not affect you directly, but they could affect uh, one of your children or a sibling or, or your parents. It is not a game. Looking around... It doesn't seem that common sense is very common in certain sectors. That needs to change. Premier has referenced shopping, for example. Shopping can now no longer be a family activity. Shopping has to be for things that are essential to keep your family and your household going week over week as this pandemic evolves. One person, one trip each week. Don't take your children with you unless there is really no alternative. And please don't let them lick the handles on the shopping cart. It's not the time to be out test driving cars. We have seen stories of uh, people trying hard to circumvent the arrangements around visiting, for example, at acute care facilities. They take their elderly relative out on a day pass and then sit them in someone's lobby uh, or someone's parlour and have 20 or 30 people troop through the house over the course of the day. And then the patient goes back to the hospital. This is not sensible. In what world does it make sense? Create yourself a bubble of protection. Stay in it and don't burst anybody else's. But really, if you don't need to move your bubble outside of the house, please don't. As the Premier and I have said before, this virus cannot move without you. If you do not move, it cannot move, it cannot spread. The time to get this right is now, and the repercussions of not getting that right will echo over the next weeks and months as we try and deal with the fallout. So again, I'll conclude my remarks today uh, and hand it back to the Premier. Thank you, Minister Hagee. We now turn it over to questions from the media. For the benefit of our speakers, we have nine reporters registered for today's call. In the essence of time, each reporter will have the opportunity to ask two questions and one follow-up. We will run through the telephone queue, so each is given an opportunity. Following this, should time permit, I will ask if there are any further questions. I reiterate that we have nine reporters on the line. We want you all to be able to ask questions. This call will end at 3.29 p.m., and further questions can be emailed. Operator, please proceed. Thank you. If you have a question at this time, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. And the first question is from Peter Cowan from CBC. Please go ahead. Premier, the refinery is going to be shut down, and it looks like this may be in place for months. They supply a number of key fuels, but I know propane is one of the main ones. Uh, what's being done in order to make sure that we don't run out of fuel? Yeah, so we did speak with the uh, North Atlantic refining uh, throughout the weekend. We've had a number of calls. So right now, propane, uh, we've asked them about their inventory. And first of all, this is really a suspending, a suspension of, ser of the refinery. They will keep their uh, service stations and supply chain in place. This is not related to COVID-19 or the practices or the guidelines uh, we've put in place. This is really about a global economic issue that they're facing primarily to the price of oil. 
Uh, so the inventory that they have in place for propane, which they supply 100% of the propane to the province, there is inventory available to support them through this, this time. Also around jet fuel, they supply 100% of the jet fuel to the province. There is an inventory of that. They are not the only provider of gasoline. And speaking to the other provider, we, uh, uh, we're now checking on the amount of inventory that would be acquired, but there is substantial inventory and we think that those supplies can be maintained. And that's the same for diesel and home heating fuel as well. So we're working very closely with all the providers in the province to make sure that the inventories are appropriate to see us through this time. People in Labrador West in particular are concerned about the number of people traveling back and forth to the St. John's area where we're seeing the biggest cluster of cases. They want to be able to require people to self-isolate if they come to Labrador, but they're being told they're not allowed to bring in those rules. Why is that the case and why is that not a good move to make? Well, for a state of emergency within a community, there's a number of uh, you know, criteria that a community could actually uh, to put into their own state of emergency, a disaster, it could be flooding, it could be without water and so on. So there's a bit of, there's some criteria in place by municipal affairs and environment, that department. But you know, we, uh, right now you see the guidelines that we put in place and once again today, you know, stressing the need for essential travel only uh, from the IOC and the mining. We know now that the fly in, fly out employees are, are substantially down to zero. We've seen the capacity and, and the, the operations cut back substantially. So we're working with the community. I've had a, a call. I spoke to both mayors just prior to the media availability yesterday. So we're working with the chief medical officer already this morning again and just to see what options are available to us. We do have both the RNC and the Quebec Police, uh, the Fermont uh, Labrador West border as well. So right now it's stressing essential travel only. Uh, only when necessary should you travel outside of Lab West into other areas of Labrador or into the province. And finally, uh, there are non-urgent procedures that have been suspended, for example, things like foot care for diabetics at the gathering place. If this is expected to drag on for months, some of those things that were non-urgent start to become more urgent. What's the plan to try and be able to deal with some of those, what may seem more minor procedures, but start to become um, more important and can affect long-term health? That's a very good question, Peter. We've actually framed a lot of our, um, our thinking around what is it we need to do to regard as essential services bearing in mind this will not be over by June and maybe even longer into the year. And hence some of the decisions which people outside have regarded as a bit paradoxical about letting service uh, facilities stay open, for example. Certainly in terms of um, foot care and that kind of thing, that would be reviewed in the light of the passage of time. Uh, quite frankly, uh, our concern for the immediate short term is to protect our seniors, our most vulnerable, and we know that the risks are directly related to visitation in long-term care facilities. That's our priority at the moment. As time goes by, the weeks and months maybe go by, obviously you're quite right. There will be a reassessment on a periodic basis of what makes sense. Thank you. The next question is from Kellyanne Robert from NTV News. Please go ahead. Thank you. I'm wondering, is there a breakdown of the testing numbers per region? Um, that's another interesting question. We can certainly find that for you. I don't actually have those figures to hand, but we could uh, we could get that without too much difficulty. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Sorry, Minister, it's a chance here. Uh, I was on mute. Um, so we we only have a breakdown of uh, positive cases at the moment, but we can get the others, yes. Thank you. Um, I'm hearing from a lot of fishermen. They're wondering, is the fishery going to open or is aid going to be given to enterprise owners because EI just doesn't cover uh, half their expenses? Yes, yeah, so we're working with the federal government. Uh, we've had some initial contacts with the, through the Minister of uh, Forest uh, and Fishery and Land Resources in our, in our province, Minister Byrne, who was working with the industry, realizing that the situation and keeping compliance 
with things like physical distancing, uh, both for the harvesting sector and for the processing sector, you know, can be a little difficult. So we're working with that sector right now to see uh, what can be done. Uh, there's some interest uh, amongst uh, enterprise owners to actually to be able to, uh, to support a fishery, and there are others who are concerned about how you do that safely. So we're working very closely with the industry to make a final determination on what the uh, industry would look like this year. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure who can answer this, but we're seeing that reports that uh, a pharmacy worker at Sobeys on top of the road has tested positive in the last day worked with March 26. Uh, concerns about green value growth around the Northern Peninsula. Do we have any update about the exposure at these places? My, <clears throat> excuse me. My understanding is that uh, Sobeys have issued a release saying that they have uh, uh, cleaned their premises thoroughly. I know that public health here would have been engaged in contact tracing uh, and those people who were at risk would have been identified and advised appropriately. Uh, other than that, I'm not sure whether Dr. Fitzgerald can add any further context. Uh, no, not at this time. That's what I have as well. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Ben Murphy from uh, BOCM News. Please go ahead. that mean for people who could have possibly picked up prescriptions there during that period? Uh, I think you were cut off a little bit at the beginning there. Obviously, there will be uh, an analysis of who would have been at risk over the course of the time the individual worked. That would be dealt with through public health. Uh, and again, if anybody has been there and has developed symptoms, they should fill in the online assessment tool and if need be, call 811 and they will be advised accordingly. And Minister Haggy, do you have any update on Saturday's incident at Costco? Uh, my understanding is this was handed to the RNC. Uh, the issue of compliance has been addressed uh, and the RNC are prepared to act if that uh, changes. And now, just further to that, as a follow-up, hearing that Costco is now calling people about Saturday's incident, uh, possibly if they were in the same lineup as this person, but we saw the same thing with Calls Funeral Home. Why is public health not getting out in front of this and making these calls, and especially like we saw with Calls Funeral Home and now over 100 cases linked to Calls Funeral Home, and if it wasn't for them coming out and saying it, it could have been many more. The contact tracing at Cole's Funeral Home was related to the fact there were multiple parallel events going on in that building over the period of three working days. When it became apparent that contact tracing was likely to miss uh, items or individuals, that was when the advisory, the instruction went out from the Medical Officer of Health. Uh, on the basis of information we have from public health staff at the moment, that is not the situation there. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Patrick Butler from Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Hello. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about testing capacity for the province. How many people can be tested uh, per day in Newfoundland Labrador right now, and, and will we see that number increase in the coming days? The laboratory capacity is only part of that equation. Uh, the question is uh, around the uh, screening and the testing that's advised by public health. At the moment, we've not been advised of any bottlenecks. Uh, public Health Laboratory in Eastern Health is working on uh, further increasing their testing capacity, uh, and those changes could be in place as early as the end of this week. Uh, and about how much are you looking to, give you to, to sort of quantify that? Um, what does that mean increasing over the course of the week? Currently, my understanding is the testing uh, numbers per day are between two and 300 that are submitted to the Public Health Lab here. The capacity of the current machine is at least of the order of 600, and the changes that Public Health Lab would be introducing when fully realized would probably more than treble that capacity in a day. Okay. Um, the other thing I want to ask you is, uh, you mentioned, we talked about this, uh, this, uh, um, positive cases earlier. I just want to understand why um, we've switched to just talking about positive declared cases and, and, and 
uh, and not uh, coming out each day with the amount of, uh, of presumed cases as well. The laboratory has a validation process uh, with the National Microbiological Labor Laboratory. Uh, it requires 50 samples negative and 50 samples positive to be tested in both locations and for the results to agree. Uh, we passed that threshold with the negative tests fairly early on. Some stage last week, we passed the 50 threshold and the NML gave us the all clear. So any test that is done in this province now is a confirmed positive or a confirmed negative. Thank you. The next question is from Peter Jackson from The Telegram. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, the, um, the number of positive cases uh, in this province is now about twice the national average, and the testing uh, seems to be on the low end of that scale. Um, I realize you've already talked about testing capacity, but are there any plans to address the uh, second part of that equation? The testing, um, the numbers of tests per day, is that what you mean, Peter? No, I mean that if you take national statistics, we are on the low end of the scale with per capita testing, and yet we now have the second highest or uh, number of cases. Yeah, I, so I, I'm just wondering if there's any intention of expanding the, the testing at all. The testing is based on public health recommendations. The fact that we actually have a good pickup rate like that might actually be interpreted as saying that traditional contact tracing and public health shoe leather detection, as it were, is actually working. Obviously, uh, in discussions with Dr. Fitzgerald and epidemiologists, if there is a need to change our testing policy on the basis of developments, and this is a fluid situation, then we would be happy to reconsider and do differently. Yeah, so Peter, too, uh, I think if you look at the statistics of the day and they're all publicly available, we would probably be around sixth or maybe seventh, depending on some of the reporting of some other provinces. So we're kind of in the middle of the pack once you exclude the territories with small population numbers. Uh, we have the capacity uh, to, you know, to do more tests, but it comes down to sometimes, you know, just staffing and so on. Uh, and we can work with that. But the, you know, the thing that's interesting about all of this is when you look at the, the statistics and with calls being such an outlier, it is very difficult to compare, you know, where we are with 148 and with the, as, as Minister Hagee has said, with the contact tracing, you know, this could be seen as them doing a very good job and picking up those those positive cases and so it's it's really just not about the number of tests and sometimes it can be about the timing because you got to be so careful if you test and do mass testing you could have some false negatives and see in just a couple of days later they could be positive uh, they could be positive for covid-19 so it's important that we uh, you know we consider all those factors before you do mass testing uh, and so sometimes it can be very helpful and sometimes it can be not as beneficial because you could have false negatives out there as well. And indeed, a few days later, they could be positive. Okay, thanks. Uh, my, ne my next question is uh, about, the, uh, about uh, parents who are sharing custody of their children. What are your recommendations for people in that position? Uh, I've been in discussions with uh, Minister Parsons, uh, Minister of Justice, uh, there are some guidelines up on our uh, COVID-19 uh, website. Uh, essentially, uh, it is uh, uh, a court-mandated issue. Uh, to change that would actually require either consent of both parties, I understand, or to go back to the court. But the interests of the child should predominate in any decision parents uh, sharing custody should choose to make. Okay. And I, I just want one last uh, follow-up, and that is, um, that a lot of people are uh, hearing the word stay home over and over and over again in these briefings. And uh, because of that, you know, we were getting lots of anecdotes of joggers and dog walkers and stuff being scolded and harassed, like, you know, no one on the streets kind of thing. I know I've asked this before, but can you lay out those parameters again? Uh, you know, people are going shack -wacky. Is there any way uh, that they are violating uh, orders by doing something like that? Um, so if somebody is uh, not self-isolating, um, it is okay to go out for a walk by yourself um, 
or if you're going with your your child, uh, trying to maintain social distancing within your family group, of course. Um, but it is okay to be outside uh, playing in your yard or going for a walk, <clears throat> excuse me, or for um, a jog or a bike ride. Uh, if you are self-isolating, if you've been asked to self-isolate, either because you're a contact or because you um, have traveled and are recently home, then we're asking you to stay on your property. The next question is from Elizabeth Witten from All Newfoundland Labrador. Please go ahead. Uh, this is for Minister Hagee. Yesterday we were told no one ha was put on a ventilator because of COVID-19. And I know we can't get into the specifics for privacy reasons, but how quickly can a patient's state deteriorate? It would vary. Uh, it can be quite rapid from my understanding of what I have been told by uh, clinicians. Uh, by and large, uh, that is uh, uh, an unpredictable in any given case. All right. And uh, was this patient put on the ventilator? I'm not going to answer that question. Okay, then. Um, can we get an update on any RNC investigations, like how many are ongoing and how many fines have been issued? Uh, from my information, as of 8.30, uh, sorry, as of um, uh, 12 o'clock uh, yesterday, there were four um, issues that the RNC were following up on. Uh, I have not been aware of any charges being laid. All right. And uh, this is for the Premier. Is there a contractual relationship between the NLC and the government to produce hand sanitizer? Or is the NLC kind of eating the cost and providing it free to the government? I'm not so sure what the contractual cost would be. It's important now that we have these hand sanitizers available, you know, for because there was a shortage of hand sanitizers. So this was something that the NLC, that they took up on themselves, given the inventories that they would have had. As you know, there's, you know, alcohol is a big part of the effectiveness of hand sanitizer. So whether there's a contractual, uh, you know, a contract with NLC, uh, I could get those details for you. But the important thing is, is having the product available, giving the, the fact that it was a there was a short supply at the time so we're proud that NLC was able to step up and and others too we've had some other uh, distilleries that have stepped up and made some good products to help protect and stop the spread of COVID. In actual fact we've had some compounding pharmacies who've also good. made their own in, in central and other areas across the province so it's great to see. All right well thank you. The next question is from Holly McKenzie Sutter from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi. Can you confirm uh, the day that this uh, man passed away? Was it yesterday or today? I think it was late last night. Thank you. And is there anything else? I know we said uh, that he had some underlying health conditions. Can you give any more specifics about uh, what those were? We've, uh, you know, Holly, I had a uh, long discussion with a family member and the son this morning, and as I made it, as I said in my remarks to the province today, uh, we send out our condolences to the family, and they have asked for privacy on this issue. You can imagine, you know, what the family is going through, and as I said, this could be some other family tomorrow. So, you know, the, the issues and questions related to this gentleman, I think it's, we respect the wishes of the family today, and, you know, in, in due course, we'll let the family decide on the type of information, if any, that should be made public. But today, it's not even 24 hours. And, you know, I think right now what we've been asked to do is send our thoughts and prayers to the family and respect their privacy. You raise a very interesting question about the balance between the interest in public health and the public good and the responsibility I have, for example, as a minister responsible for enforcing and administering the, public, the Personal Health Information Act. What we decided when we released the information we did was we looked at what other jurisdictions had done and then fed that through a local lens. So that's the kind of information that we were prepared to release and we're not prepared to release anymore. The family, in addition, have asked for the privacy, as the Premier has said. So I think that's the standard bar that a lot of jurisdictions have used and we will continue to, to follow that. Perfect, thanks. The next question is from Peter Cowan from CBC. Please go ahead. Uh, operator, do we have any questions from Steve McKinley of the Toronto Star or Genevieve Normand of Radio Canada?
May we continue with Mr. Cohen? Yes, please. Please go ahead. The April 1st uh, date for people who are at the Calls Funeral Home, uh, the deadline that they have to uh, self-isolate until, a lot of people are wondering, what's going to happen after that date? Is Some, for example, haven't been tested. Is it safe for them a after that point to just be back out in the community, or is there a sort of testing procedure in order to make sure that they're not positive? Um, so anyone who has been exposed to COVID-19, the incubation period is uh, 14 days. So um, we that date is 14 days post the last exposure. So um, at that point, if someone has not developed symptoms, then they're not likely to have been exposed and therefore okay to, uh, to come off isolation or quarantine. Sorry. One of the tragic things with this is that when people do die um, and it's more severe, they're in hospital, and of course, friends and family aren't able to be around them at, at those last moments. Are we using technology or anything else to try and be able to give families that final farewell before a loved one passes away in a situation like we saw last night? We're certainly open to that. Uh, I would actually have to check with, uh, with the facilities across the province to see what their various states of readiness is, but that's certainly something we would be prepared to look at. And we've seen drug companies uh, coming out with rapid testing where the results come back with minutes rather than hours or days. Are we looking at using any of that in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador? Those tests require validation against a current gold standard to make sure they're actually doing what they say they do. Uh, these are commercial uh, kits that are sold on an open commercial market. If they have merit uh, and that can be demonstrated in the usual way, that Health Canada have a rapid licensing process, and we'd certainly be interested in anything that would expand our ability to, uh, to make informed decisions about who's positive and who's not. Thank you. The next question is from Kellyanne Roberts from NTV News. Please go ahead. Thank you. Minister Greggy, have any recently retired physicians, nurses, uh, surgeons decided to relicense yet? I've had communications from a variety of professionals who have retired some quite some time ago. Uh, I've directed each of those to their appropriate licensing body uh, and left it with them. Uh, at the moment, uh, we have no indication that our current healthcare provider capacity is overtaxed to the point uh, where uh, uh, we would put out a call more generally. But certainly any offers of help are welcome, and I pointed them towards the College of Physicians and Surgeons or the College of Registered Nurses, for example. Thank you. And we know, um, or we have been told as of last week, there were nine healthcare workers that had tested positive um, for the virus. Do we know if there are any more? That was the last number I had. I don't know if Dr. Fitzgerald's got a different number. Uh, nope, that's the last number I have as well. And um, in looking to child care, I know other jurisdictions have uh, turned to med students whose clinical rotations have been cut short and licensing exams are currently up in the air. Are we also looking to see if those students would be available um, for child care services? So right now we're working on a number of options with uh, the commitment to provide child care to essential workers. And so we've been working through the weekend with uh, obviously those individuals, there have been a lot of calls that's been made reaching out, you know, determining age and what would the requirement would be because this goes to age 13. So uh, right now we've agreed that we would actually pay families uh, that could find their own child, uh, child care spaces and that we, we would reimburse them and then realizing if we can't uh, find those spaces for all those uh, essential workers, then we would look at what would be the tier two options that, we, that would be available for us. And so keeping in mind, some of those are up to age 13, as I just said, so it's very different than what we would have seen in the past practice, but that work is continuing uh, through the department and we want to find a resolution now as quickly as possible as we recognize there is a need for those that cannot find childcare spaces and we want to support the essential workers as Dr. Hagee and Minister Hagee and, and uh, Dr. Fitzgerald said many times, uh, this is not going to be a few weeks, this will be months and so we must make sure that we have those essential workers available to us and that childcare, childcare spaces is not an option for them to do the valuable work that they're doing on behalf of our province. Thank you. The next 
question. It's from Ben Murphy from BOCM News. Please go ahead. Um, Dr. Fitzgerald or Minister Hagee, the number of new cases has dropped for about three or four days in a row now since we saw that big spike, 32. Is this a good sign in your eyes of a downward trend despite it only being early? This is very early in the game and, and too early to really make uh, any kind of uh, assumption like that. But uh, certainly what we've seen um, with the majority of these cases is that they've been related to um, uh, the call funeral home cluster. So as we are getting further away from that, um, it's not unexpected that we would see a slight drop in cases. Uh, but only time really will tell uh, what, our, what our pattern is going to be or what our uh, trajectory is going to be. Please don't use that as a cause or an excuse for complacency. This is not the time to be looking for loopholes. This is a time to stay the course. A lot of people have made significant efforts to abide by our recommendations and our orders. But just because we've seen a temporary a dip in numbers doesn't mean to say that's the start of a new trend. And it would be most unwise to assume that under any circumstances. We are not out of the woods yet. No, absolutely, Minister. I would echo that. Um, we have seen community spread. Uh, it is in our community, so we need to be vigilant um, and, and not be looking at, at this slight dip as, as any kind of an indication that we can, be, uh, that we can slack back on these measures. Yeah. And, Dr. Fitzgerald, can you tell us anything further on asymptomatic transmission of COVID-19? Uh, so... There's been a lot of um, research and, and uh, analysis of the, the information regarding asymptomatic transmission. Uh, what the evidence is saying is that it certainly is a possibility. It is not the main driver of spread of COVID-19. So while some people may be able to transmit the disease just before they become overtly symptomatic, so in the 24 to 48 hours before they develop a cough or a fever, some of those people are actually mildly symptomatic in that period of time, um, and so just don't fully recognize their symptoms as being a part of the illness, um, and some people are can be asymptomatic. So it, there's a bit of a difference between asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic uh, transmission. Uh, so what we know is that the majority of people who are transmitting this disease, uh, over 80% for sure, are symptomatic, coughing, um, you know, feverish, and have other more overt symptoms of this disease. But I think bears to the point that it's even more important now, more than ever, to make sure that you follow the public health measures to stay home, uh, to wash your hands well when you when only go out for essential uh, essential certain needs. And, um, and to make sure that you're protecting yourself, stay within your bubble, protect yourself and your, and your family. And lastly, just hearing concerns from some people who were mixed up at Calls Funeral Home who have been waiting for test results for up to six days now. They're just looking for answers, and they say they're being bounced around to different numbers of different people, anxious, worried. Uh, just what, what can you say to these people to try to ease some of these concerns? From the point of view of test results, uh, we are conscious that there is a, a, a delay in some of the negative results. Uh, we're working on that, and indeed, we're actually working on whether or not we could perhaps get, say, text notification, as the majority of people do seem to have uh, cell phones uh, these days. So that's a work in progress, and, and I think uh, things will improve uh, in the not-too-distant future. Thank you very much. The next question is from Peter Jackson from The Telegram. Please go ahead. Um, hi. Uh, this was alluded to earlier, the possibility of someone testing negative uh, and then later on actually becoming po testing positive. Uh, how often does that happen? Are you testing people more than once? If somebody is uh, sick with an illness that appears to be covid or is suspicious for COVID based on their symptom pattern. Uh, if their first test is negative and the clinicians are highly suspicious, then they will test again. Um, and uh, we have had that situation happen, and it can happen. Um, it's certainly not in the majority of cases. Uh, there is a, um, 
you know, the case will, it's quite sensitive. It will pick up most uh, cases of um, COVID-19. Um, and so, but we do have to be extra cautious. So the, the rule of thumb is if, if you suspect it and the test comes back negative, don't just assume you, you need to test again. But that's for people who are presenting with symptoms that are fairly uh, typical for COVID, right? Okay, so and I, I just had the one follow. I don't have three questions. Uh, does that mean that someone who is asymptomatic uh, has a test done because they were a contact? Can they assume that that's going to be accurate, or is it possible they will actually end up with the disease that just wasn't detected? Yes. Yeah, so if it's very early in the disease, and that was the importance of of talking about that timing, right, and making sure that you're doing the test at the right time. If they were early in progression with that disease, you may not pick it up. Uh, that is why we ask anyone who's been tested and who is a contact that they have to self-isolate for the 14 days after the last known contact with with the case. Okay, and that uh, will wait out the incubation period of the virus. If they become symptomatic at any point in that 14 days, then we would test them again. Okay, thank you. The next question is from uh, Peter Cowan from the CBC. Please go ahead. There are people who have loved ones in long-term care homes who are worried about what the procedure is if there are positive cases, for example, places like Pleasant View Towers. Do people get removed? Do people get isolated? Uh, and they're struggling to find and to actually get answers on this. What are the procedures if a long-term care home, for example, has some positive cases for the residents? Each of the RHAs has a plan that is p particular to the facility concern because not all of them are the same geographically or in the, the numbers of patients that they have. They have arrangements that may vary from uh, moving rooms and uh, assigning a specific area to patients who are COVID positive or maybe even using uh, uh, space created by moving other patients into other facilities. It varies uh, from region to region and facility to facility. But each RHA is uh, in a position where there are plans for each of their individual long-term care facilities. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Holly McKenzie Sutter from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi. Remember uh, last week, Dr. Fitzgerald said that the calls cluster includes direct and indirect contact with the first individual in the actual funeral home space. So now that we're calling it, you know, the biggest cluster in the country, is there a consistent criteria that's being used to define cluster across Canada? Um, so a cluster basically means a group of cases that can all be linked in time or in space and geographic location um, and that, you know, when we find cases, we can link it back to that cluster. So um, that's essentially what it is. Um, I, I don't know if that is a, a standardized definition across the country, but it's not about size or, or anything like that. It's, it's basically about the linkage of the cases. Okay, I guess I just wanted to know, like, what indirect contact means if, you know, someone went to the service and then um, a co-worker or a relative or somebody else out in the community. Um, I guess in some instances that might not sound like a direct cluster, you know what I mean? Yeah. So direct contact means somebody who was uh, in contact with the uh, either initial case or cases, and then indirect would be if they have those people then contracted it at the at the event and then they passed it on they passed it on to somebody else outside of the event that would be an indirect person uh, case okay thanks and one last question about the hospitalizations uh, can you say what health authorities those are located in we have uh, nine across the province hospitalized seven of those are in eastern one is in central and one is in labrador grenfell The next question is from Patrick Butler from Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Uh, hi there. Um, British Columbia announced uh, rules requiring, requiring measures at grocery stores where you would see hand sanitizers there at entrances and near checkout, places like that, any place where people would come into contact with things touched by many people. Um, 
these are places where a lot of people are, are going. You've, met, you've alluded to it already. Um, is that something that you've considered uh, to institute here in Newfoundland and Labrador? The issue of how the premises are run are guided by the general principles of social distancing. Some, uh, some stores are uh, uh, adopting a slightly different approach than, uh, than others. I think if there is a concern that uh, is raised about the practices in a store that don't seem to fit with that, there are mechanisms. And I know Service NL, for example, has had uh, uh, questions and continues to perform uh, a variety of investigations on businesses uh, about which there have been complaints. So, I mean, I think best practices are, uh, you know, wash your hands frequently, avoid touching your face, provide and use alcohol-based hand sanitizer, and keep your distance. Uh, the stores I've been in, and there haven't been many, uh, my wife's not allowing me out at the moment, um, but basically they have markings on the floor uh, that uh, are six uh, or more feet apart, uh, and some of them are really quite enthusiastic about enforcing that distance. Unfortunately, some are not, and I think those are the ones where we need to concentrate. Thank you. The next question is from Elizabeth Witten from All Newfoundland, Labrador. Please go ahead. I'm curious, are there certain medical conditions that put certain people at a greater risk for a more severe reaction to COVID-19, maybe like diabetes or asthma? And I ask it because Newfoundland has a higher percentage of diabetes than, than across Canada, and we also have a slightly less healthy population. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so we know that uh, uh, certain types of uh, heart and cardiovascular disease can put people at higher risk, um, lung diseases, diabetes as well, um, are certainly three of the um, chronic diseases that can put people at higher risk for more severe COVID disease. Uh, that was my only question. Thank you. The next question is from Ben Murphy from BOCM News. Please go ahead. Um, Mr. Haggy, just wanted if you could tell us about the Waterford preparedness and PPE availability. Nurses there say it's almost impossible to physical distance having to make patient contract, and they say that PPE is almost at it. Uh, the uh, is issue around the individual unit's working circumstances uh, have not been brought to my attention as being problematic. Uh, I can accept that the nature of uh, looking after patients with mental health or addictions problems may be somewhat different than uh, than people with, with physical illnesses. Certainly if those nurses or uh, indeed any of the staff there have concerns, uh, there, uh, there are mechanisms for them to bring that forward, uh, either through their, uh, their managers, their union, or the occupational health and safety uh, reps. But I've not been made aware of any specific issues related to the Waterford. Um, and we're still hearing lots of concerns about construction sites, uh, valet, Moncourt science, people getting bused to these different locations, not practicing social distancing. At what point will government just shut these construction sites down? Well, the construction sites, is some, in many cases, is just not simply just, you know, pushing a switch and shutting the site down. Uh, there's, you know, some things that we would need to consider before making uh, decisions like that. Many provinces has determined construction sites to be essential. And that's happened across, and there's a, a, you know, there's a number of different, you know, opinions as we see this in other provinces. But one thing for sure, uh, which is very consistent, no matter where you go, that every workplace must be able to practice the guidelines that we put in place by the chief medical officer. So practicing uh, physical distancing on those sites, making uh, the, having the proper hygiene and and capacity in place to make sure that the employees uh, have a safe working uh, or workplace. So no matter where the site is, uh, those, uh, those physical distancing and proper hygiene, having those facilities available, these are, uh, these are the requirements in order for those, uh, you know, the businesses or those construction site sites to continue. Thank you very much for attending, folks. The time for questions has ended. <laughs>